Uh, thanks for showing up. I hope the food coma isn't, I, I assume it's starting to set in. So if you nod off, I think I'll, I won't take it personally. Thanks for showing up to this session. Uh, my name is Kevin Levin. Um, this is my first history camp. Uh, I'm having an absolute blast. I signed up just to be a participant. Um, I was happy just to do that. And then I was asked to give a presentation. Uh, and I was happy to do that. So I uh, decided to talk about a project that has, been, that has occupied my life uh, at least going back to 2006. Uh, and that is uh, based on a book that's coming out in just a couple of months. I'm just about finished uh, reviewing the page proofs, which if any of you have ever gone through that process is absolutely uh, mind-numbing uh, experience. Uh, but my, a little bit about my background. Um, I have my hat in a number of different rings. Uh, I'm a high school teacher. Right now I'm teaching a class at a private school in Waltham. Um, essentially a public history class for high school students that's centered on the history of disability. We're writing uh, and interpreting the history of the Fernald School, which, um, which is located uh, in Waltham. And on the side are what other things that I do. Uh, I work with uh, teachers and students across the country. I've been doing this for a couple of years now on trying to better understand the whole debate right now about Confederate monuments and memorials. So I do a lot of traveling. Uh, to places where they're dealing with this issue, and uh, it's really just exciting work, including here in Boston. But I'm going to talk about this project. Um, I've been writing about this, thinking about it since 2006. I've been blogging since 2005, and I recently went back and looked at my blog called Civil War Memory, and the first post was 2006. So I've been thinking about this for quite some time. It's a project, a book project that I've started on a number of occasions and put aside. At one point, I said, I'm never going to think about this subject ever again. And then a couple years ago, I realized that uh, if I don't do it, I'm going to regret it. So uh, I sat myself down and, uh, and got to this point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a bunch of images and sort of riff on these images and give you a sense of, of what this subject is about, why it's so controversial. I'm going to try and get through the slides relatively fast, because I suspect that a lot of you are going to have some questions. And I want to leave enough time for those questions. If you really sort of, you want to interrupt me, you have something you just want to get off, uh, you, want, you want to share, please just do it. Don't worry about it. This, is, this can be pretty informal. I want to start with this image. Uh, this is an image that some of you might be familiar with. It is one of the most controversial images from the Civil War era. We don't know when it was taken, likely in the late spring, summer of 1861. For many people who believe, or you'll find this image on anywhere between you know, 500 and you know, 5,000 websites currently. And the people who post this image will claim that anywhere between 50, and you ready for this, 100,000 <coughs> African Americans fought as soldiers in the Confederate Army. Now, if you look at this image, you can see why they might jump to that conclusion. You've got two individuals, one black, one white, sitting side by side. They are both uniformed. They are indeed wearing Confederate uniforms. And they are armed to the teeth, right? On the left is a young, the time he enlisted, private named Andrew Chandler, uh, grew up in West Point, Mississippi, the northwest corner of the state of Mississippi. And to his left is an enslaved man by the name of Silas Chandler. Silas had uh, grown up in the Chandler family first. He was born in Virginia. He moved with the Chandler family to Mississippi in the 1840s as part of that push to the new uh, cotton kingdom that's opening up between roughly Georgia and East Texas. And the family was quite successful. If you look at this image, again, you can see why people will draw the conclusion that they were both soldiers. Just look at the weapons. But take a closer look. Now when I look at this image, I don't see it as two soldiers. In fact, when I look at this image, this photograph, I often laugh. Because if you look closely, what you're going to see are, are very likely studio props, uh, especially the little pistol in Silas's artillerist jacket. These are very likely studio props. And if you look, you get the sense that Andrew, who's roughly 17, 18 years old, Silas about seven years older, that Andrew is just having a really good time in the studio. How many weapons 
can we fit in this shot? It's a highly unusual shot, as you'll see in a second. The idea of two men sitting, an enslaved man, and the master sitting side by side. But in fact, what you are looking at is what Andrew would have called his personal body servant, or what I will call, quite often, his camp slave, to make sure that there's no discrepancy, no uh, lack of clarity as to, as to Silas's legal status. Silas, like thousands of enslaved men from across the Confederacy, went off to war with their master as their body servant or their camp slave. In fact, Silas served until the very last days of the war. The man on, on the left, Andrew, was wounded at Chickamauga in September of 1863. Silas escorted him back home to Mississippi, and a few months later went back to war with his brother Benjamin in a cavalry unit, which ended up, after the fall of Richmond, escorting Jefferson Davis's group out of Richmond through Georgia to where he was captured by Union forces. So Silas Chandler uh, likely, well, I mean, very likely saw the very end of the war with the capture of the Confederate President uh, Jefferson Davis. And that's when he attained his freedom. So this discrepancy between the way in which Confederates between 1861 to 1865 would have understood Silas's place in this photograph is starkly different from how many Americans today will interpret this image. And it's a failure to understand basic Civil War history. The place of slavery in the Confederacy, the goal of the Confederacy, and the overall outcome of the war itself. And that's what I want to talk about. Now, Silas is a personal body servant. There were thousands of these men who went off with officers and privates from the slaveholding class. They would have reinforced their status as slaveholders in the Confederate Army. But these men were one element in this employment of black bodies by the Confederacy during the war. And it's not difficult to understand why this was necessary. The Confederacy, of course, suffers from a major lack of resources, from war material to human resources, right? Just in terms of the population difference. Uh, the Confederacy has to mobilize as many bodies as possible. Mobilizing black bodies as enslaved uh, workers frees up more white men to carry a rifle in the front lines. And what you see here is an image from James Island, just uh, off the coast, or just a, a, a little bit away from uh, Charleston where the embers of secession, of course, were first kindled. And you can see thousands of impressed slaves digging earthworks, doing the sort of tough jobs the Confederacy needs done uh, to actually conduct the war. They would have dug earthworks. They would have worked on rail lines, constructing rail lines. They would have worked in the Tredegar Ironworks, uh, building cannon. Anything that needs to be done militarily for the Confederacy Throughout the war, they will employ slave labor. So the Confederacy were the place of slaves. If you're talking about a slave nation at war, look no further than the role that enslaved men played themselves in furthering that project. In the armies, if you're thinking of Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, at any one time, take, for example, in the summer of 1863 with Lee marching north, into southern Pennsylvania in late June, culminating in the Battle of Gettysburg, an army that numbered somewhere around 75,000 likely would have included 10,000 enslaved men. So the very idea, when we talk about 25% of white southern men, not, only 25% owning slaves, we need to keep in mind that whether you were a slave owner or not, you were surrounded by enslaved men and you would, have, you would have understood your place in an army that was functioning as the extension of a government whose sole purpose for existence was the protection of slavery and a system of white supremacy. And these men would have served as a day-to-day -day reminder of that goal. Okay? So you have the camp servants, or the body servants, and the tens of thousands of impressed slaves that are going off to war individually with their owners, or impressed by the Confederate government. Now, I'm going to stick to the body servants. And this is a more typical image that you would have found from the war itself. A uniformed body servant. Some of them were outfitted by their masters. 
to reinforce their own rank. Some of these men actually earn money in camp during their free time to buy a uniform, uh, to make themselves look more military-like. And quite often, I found that their masters allowed this to take place. But just backing up for a, uh, for a quick second, these men would have performed any kind of job requested or ordered or demanded by their owner. They would have taken care of horses. They would have taken care of cleaning. Cooking, of course, would have been crucial. They would have foraged while on the march, especially during times when uh, food stuff, food resources were scarce. They would have served as, a, uh, as communication, as a messenger between the front and the home front. So these men would have done anything, or would have been forced to do anything, required by their masters. They existed outside of the military hierarchy of the Confederacy. They served their master solely, no one else. Um, and this, of course, is, is an example from Alabama. We don't know much about Burrell, uh, but this is more likely, this is the more typical image of the camp slave um, and the master, the young master, as you can see here. Some of these men also find themselves on the battlefield. And there are a number of accounts of enslaved men, body servants, uh, picking up a gun, a rifle, on the battlefield and firing or shooting at Yankee soldiers. This is some of the most controversial accounts, as you might imagine, uh, you know, that you'll find uh, about these men because in the wrong hands, they are almost always interpreted as reflecting their, their rank as soldier, their place in the army as soldiers. We don't have much to go on in terms of what these experiences meant to, to a camp slave like Burrell, because almost always when you're studying these men, you're reading about them through the eyes of their owners. And their owners see them as, or see any act that a, that a camp slave performs as a reflection of their undying loyalty and fidelity to master and the Confederacy, okay? So we do know that some of these men end up on the battlefield. I suspect that some of them wanted to experience a battle. I suspect that some of these, uh, these men wanted to test their own bravery, their own manhood. Um, but we don't know much about motivation when it comes to understanding uh, individuals like the one behind me, or even Silas Chandler. Uh, the man you saw in that opening photograph. These men served in every army, or were present in every army. I have to, always have to watch myself when I say serve, because when you use that language, uh, quite often it gets misinterpreted as serving the Confederacy. But they are present in every army that's fighting throughout the war, from the beginning of the war to the very end. I suspect I have a little bit of evidence to show that after Gettysburg, by the middle, middle point of the war, these men are being sent home because they're running off in larger numbers. They're taking advantage of that. They're securing their own freedom. We have some accounts of what these officers go through when they're enslaved, when, when these body servants run off. Uh, quite often, they can't quite believe it. How could they betray me? Quite often, at least a number of accounts I have where the officer in question considers any explanation other than that the enslaved individual wanted to secure his freedom. Oh, it was a, you know, uh, another pesky camp slave that influenced him. Uh, he was influenced by any number of things. But if it wasn't for those Yankee invaders, in the end, he would have remained loyal to me and my family. Right? So loyalty and fidelity is always there in their minds. What's interesting about these stories is you know, we often sort of look at the Civil War years as the unraveling of slavery. As the Union Army moves further and further into the Deep South, we find that tens of thousands of enslaved families are taking advantage of the opportunity to, you know, to run away, to end up, to move into Union lines. After the Emancipation Proclamation, of course, those families, those enslaved individuals, are freed as a result of the proclamation. But the unraveling of slavery also takes place in the Confederate Army itself. And it takes place as the relationship between these individuals is stretched to the breaking point. Because as the war continues, enslaved men test the relationship with their masters. They ask for more privileges. They are bolder in running off for a time 
They do any number of things to test uh, that relationship, and quite often, they break it entirely. And it's another reason why I think after the midway point of the war, many of these men are sent home, rather than risk them running off. They also perform, of course, other functions. They entertain. Um, they, they entertain, and entertainment becomes a really important component of, of, of life in camp. And, and it helps to sort of reinforce that divide, that racial divide between uh, black men and white men, seeing men like this dancing, performing these kinds of roles uh, that quite often are um, degrading, right? Sort of the dancing that you see here uh, in this image. And also, I should just back up that quite often when owners see their slaves on the battlefield, they also get very ambivalent about that because, of course, that challenges the, the racial hierarchy in, in the Antebellum South. Remember, it's white men who are supposed to go onto the battlefield, demonstrate their bravery, their manhood, and face the bullets without shirking their duty. To see a black man doing this challenges some of those fundamental racial assumptions that these men go off to war with. But seeing black men dancing or seeing black men running off the battlefield and they often write about that uh, after they see these men on the battlefield. They'll say, yeah, but when the bullets started to you know, whiz by, those African-American men are hiding behind trees. They're running for cover. And in, I think doing that, they reinforce their own place uh, in the Confederate Army and in the white racial hierarchy of the South. So these men, from the beginning of the war, are everywhere in the Confederate Army. The Confederacy itself, beginning in 1864, actually goes through a very public and divisive debate about whether or not to enlist slaves as soldiers. And people who, of course, today make these claims about tens of thousands of black Confederate soldiers somehow miss the fact that when the Confederates are debating this issue in 64 and early 65, and I've been, like I said, I've been researching this for over 10 years, not one person in this debate, whether they're in the army, in the Confederate government, or writing an editorial for or against slave enlistment, not one ever mentions that black men were already fighting in the army. Not one. I mean, why actually have the debate at all if they're already serving as soldiers in the army? Well, of course, they understood that they weren't. Now, the Confederate government in March of 1865, just weeks before the end of the war, actually does authorize slave en slaves' enlistment as soldiers. Maybe somewhere around 45 are enlisted in Richmond, the Confederate capital. They are trained. They are housed in a jail at night. That gives you a sense of how much confidence the Confederates place in these men. And there's no evidence they ever see a battlefield. So the war ends for the Confederacy as a white man's war. That's what it was intended to be. I should also point out, let's not forget this. The United States also started the war and could have ended the war as a white man's war. Let's keep in mind that before 1863, there are no black soldiers in the Confederate Army. The war ends before the proclamation goes into effect on January 1st of 1863. The Union is preserved, which is what Lincoln wanted. That was his priority. And the war would have ended with slavery still very much intact, with no black soldiers serving. So both nations start off on the same trajectory. Let's keep that in mind as we're thinking about this. Now, even after the war, white Southerners, former Confederates, are dealing with defeat, the end of slavery, the death of thousands, tens of thousands of young Southern men, the end of slavery, destruction. And one of the ways that they begin to put the pieces together is they tell the story of what the Civil War was about to themselves and the rest of the world. They still want to justify what they had done. This becomes known as the lost cause narrative of the Civil War. And it includes a couple strands here, narrative strands. The first thing is, in contrast to 1861, when most Confederates were arguing that preserving slavery and white supremacy was the primary goal, after 1865, of course, they're arguing 
It was all about states' rights. It was nothing more than a constitutional disagreement between North and South. Slavery had nothing to do with it. It was incidental, as one former Confederate politician put it. In addition to that, Confederate generals like Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, embodied the best of the Christian warrior. And you can see that reflected in this post-war print. The Confederate home front was unified from beginning to end. No dissent in the Confederacy. But most importantly, it's that their slaves always remained loyal on the home front and in the army. Right? Loyal slaves are the narrative that they go with after the war. If it wasn't for those pesky Yankee invaders, we would have remained a peaceful civilization with our enslaved people as part of our family, as they would have described it. And that's reinforced in prints like this. Here you have Stonewall Jackson, again, the Christian warrior in camp, always known as sort of being this zealous Christian, leading a camp, uh, a camp prayer service. Uh, you can see his generals using their instruments of war, their swords now as instruments of prayer. And if you look closely to Jackson's right, you will see the camp slave. The camp slave is ever present. The camp slave is the representation of the loyal slave during the Lost Cause era. This is what allows white Southerners to keep their heads up, prideful, that their cause was just. It wasn't about slavery, because if it was, they wouldn't be in the army. Another uh, print here, not so clear, but I'll point a few things out. You can see the lounging, perhaps impressed slave or camp slave here, and then you see a group of African Americans in the back. Again, a peaceful scene in camp. There's no tension between Confederates and enslaved workers. Everyone knows their place, and no one moves out of that place. Again, a visual representation of the loyal slave. Former Confederates, when they write their memoirs, their accounts of the war, accounts of loyal slaves are everywhere. Confederate Veteran, which is the principal magazine of Confederate veterans, starts publication in the 1890s for the next few decades. Scores of articles about the loyalty of the camp slave. My point in emphasizing this is that no one during this time is ever confused about the legal status or role of African Americans in the Confederate Army. No one at this time is making the claim that black men are fighting as soldiers. It doesn't exist. And this continues right through the beginning of the 20th century. Here you have the dedication of the Confederate monument at Arlington National Cemetery in 1914. It is the largest monument at Arlington National Cemetery just across the river from Washington, DC. The United Daughters of the Confederacy dedicates this monument. And if you look closely, and this is how this memory gets inscribed, this lost cause, loyal slave memory. You have the loyal mammy taking the child from the Confederate officer. And then, of course, if you just look a little bit further, you see the uniformed black man. Today, often interpreted as a black soldier. But if you read the dedication addresses, if you read the history that the UDC themselves provide for this event, he is clearly marked as a loyal camp slave, not a soldier. Again, another modern day misinterpretation of the role that these men played in the war. I should point out that if you visit Arlington and you want to actually visit the black US soldiers that fought in the war, you have to make it a point first to know where you're going. And then you have to be willing, if you're there in the summer, to brave the heat to walk to the far corner of Arlington to see these men who gave their lives, many as former slaves, to save the Union and fight for the end of slavery. These 365 Confederates that are buried around this monument are buried in one of the most prominent spots in the entire cemetery. Let that sink in. Why are we having this debate right now about Confederate monuments? This is one of the reasons. They also attend veterans reunions. Throughout this period, they are welcomed at Confederate veterans reunions. This man is absolutely fascinating. Steve Everhart Perry 
He attends maybe 15 reunions during this period. He's absolutely fascinating. He served his master from Georgia by the last name of Eberhardt. But what's really interesting is his last name was Perry. His wife's name is Perry. His children go by the name of Perry. But when he attended Confederate veterans reunions, he changes it to Eberhardt. It suggests to me that this man understood the role he was playing at these reunions to entertain the veterans, to entertain the general public, which would have flocked to these veterans, to meet the men, share, hear their stories. Eberhardt would have told stories about being the loyal slave. And he was best known for carrying two chickens under his arm. And a number of these men did that. And it was as a testament to their role as foragers during the war. And those are the stories that they would have told the children and the families that would have gathered in cities and towns across the South that host these large United Confederate Veterans uh, reunions. And you can see all the pins that he wears. And you can see even perhaps parts of old uniforms. This is Jefferson Shields uh, from Virginia. Again, often thought of as a soldier. He's wearing his ribbons. He must have been welcomed as a soldier. But again, no one was confused about their role and place. And you can see, of course, another former camp slave sitting just to the side of the white veterans. Everything is very much orchestrated, choreographed. These men are kept separate in terms of usually their dining experience, where they sleep, where they appear in the march at, on the last day when the big marches took place. But they are ever present at these events. And this is one of the most fascinating images of Tampa, Florida in 1927. As many as 50 of these former camp slaves uh, may have attended any one veterans reunion. You'll see Eberhardt fourth, sitting fourth uh, from the left. Two men down with the hat on. You'll see a man with a white ribbon. If you focus in on it, it says, and when I first saw this, I was just blown away. It says, ex-slave. That's what his ribbon says, ex-slave. Few people, of course, acknowledge this. This is, for some people I've seen on the internet, part of an entire company of all black men. It just boggles the mind, right? But it tells you quite a bit about how white Southerners wanted to remember the war. And these men also appear at events, turn of the 20th century, at a critical time in Southern race relations. African Americans, a new generation that never experienced slavery, many of the young uh, uh, blacks in, in local communities are testing racial limits. They're pushing for civil rights. These men come to represent the compliant, loyal black man. This is how all African Americans should behave in the post-war South. And especially after World War I, when black men come back wearing their World War I uniforms, carrying their weapons, these men are seen as the right model. This is how you should behave. Know your place in society, deference to white authority during the height of the Jim Crow era. A couple more images here that was later the 1930s. I'm going to keep going through these. This is I'm fascinating to find this in a New York newspaper in 1920, a washing machine ad in New York. New York paper, it's Robert E. Lee, but if you look to his right, it's his body servant cleaning his socks. Again, it gives you a sense of how pervasive uh, the image of the loyal slave would have been. Think of Gone with the Wind, 1939. Uh, think of the role of the loyal slave in Gone with the Wind, and you have a sense of how Americans understood slavery uh, at, during the first half of the 20th century. I'm going to jump ahead. Things begin to change by the 1960s and 1970s. The civil rights movement opens up a, the possibility of a new counter-narrative to the lost cause. African Americans pushing for civil rights in the 50s and 60s, a lot of that is framed as the unfinished work of the Civil War era. And African Americans and scholars are beginning to discover new stories about the role of African Americans during the war, the steps they took to free themselves, the roughly 200,000 men, of course, who fought as soldiers, as real soldiers, in the United States Army. Public historians, historic sites are beginning to address the history of slavery for the first time and address the role of slaves in sites specific to the Civil War. 
But it's in the 1970s where the black Confederate narrative really first appears. And as far as I can tell, it follows the release of Roots in 1977, of all things. But it's not that surprising. Roots is one of the first big media events where a lot of people across the country, a lot of white America for the first time, first learns a darker story about the history of American slavery. And the Sons of Confederate Veterans, in response to the success of this series, the principal organization for uh, descendants of Confederate soldiers, they begin to talk amongst themselves. We're now talking about black Union soldiers. We need to find stories of our own black soldiers to counter this new narrative of emancipation and black service to the United States. So the first glimmers of the black Confederate soldier narrative appear following this story. Again, in response to Roots and in the Sons of Confederate Veterans, as well as the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And this continues into the 80s. And it doesn't really pick up steam. They're writing books that mainly SCV people, Confederate heritage people, are reading. It doesn't really have much sticking power beyond that. But it's the internet that blows it wide open. Because once the internet comes into play, anyone can create a website. You can say whatever you want on the internet. You can post whatever kind of image you want about the internet, about, a, about the history, an image like this. And you can say whatever you want. So every man becomes his own historian. Wonderful. Should every man, woman, become his or her own historian? It's one of the things I struggle with as an educator. We don't really understand how to find things, search things on the internet, and we're not teaching our kids how to assess what they're getting and finding on the internet. And it's stories like this, myths like this, that are pervasive because of that failure. This image here, which, was first, which first appeared in a Civil War magazine in 1973, was cropped. It's actually, or photoshopped, it's actually an image of black Union soldiers taken in Philadelphia in 1864. This image you will find on hundreds of websites right now. And again, if you don't know any better, they look like you, uh, Confederate soldiers. Cropped from the very ends are two clearly defined white Union officers. This photograph was eventually used, it was, created, it was used to create a colored lithograph that was used to actually recruit black men from the Philadelphia area. So it gives you a sense of how important the internet is to all of this. Without the internet, this, this narrative doesn't work. With it, it gets spread everywhere, and I mean everywhere. It's also embraced by a small number of African Americans today, including H.K. Egerton. I, I, I find him fascinating. I won't go into this part of the story, but you'll find him. He was in Oxford, Mississippi two weeks ago during that rally around the Confederate statue at Old Miss. He led the, the rally to protect the Confederate statue at Old Miss. I've communicated with him a couple times. Um, I'd love to meet him. He's absolutely, he's just a really interesting guy. Former, <laughs> former um, I don't know, president of the North Carolina chapter of the N NAACP. I'll just let you sort of <laughs> ruminate on that for a little bit. Uh, when I say this narrative has appeared in all kinds of places, I mean all kinds of places. This in 2011, it appeared in a fourth grade Virginia textbook <laughs> written by a woman named Joy Masoff, who's also written books about science, technology, all kinds of things. And in the chapter on the Civil War, she writes that thousands of Southern blacks fought in Confederate ranks, including two battalions <laughs> under Stonewall Jackson and the Confederate. Now, given what I just said about the internet, when asked where she found this information, the internet. the internet. She actually went to a Sons of Confederate Veterans website. Her intention was actually in the right place. She wanted to meet the demands of Virginia's SOLs, which of course demands that you talk about the black experience during the Civil War. All right, well she did. She just got it wrong, of course. Uh, eventually what happened was the state provided new textbooks for the wealthier counties and black tape for the poorer ones who couldn't afford to replace them. I heard from parents throughout the year that their kids were still learning the black Confederate narrative right through the end of the school year. Another example of just sort of the popular culture here uh, when we talk about this narrative. Um, 
one of the many prints of the Civil War, about the Civil War that you can buy. I'm not quite sure if the artist here thinks of this man as a body servant or as a soldier. Uh, either way, it feeds into that loyal, that loyal slave narrative that for many is, is just so seductive, uh, even, even today. I'm going to end on this, um, this image. Many of you, of course, know this image. In my opinion, it's probably the most important photograph ever taken of a Confederate battle flag. Uh, you remember that in June of 2015, Dylan Roof walked into a, a black church in Charleston and killed nine churchgoers at a Bible study session. Uh, without the emergence of, the, of these photographs with him holding the battle flag, it's unlikely that the debate that we're now having uh, about flags and monuments would have occurred. Of course, Char uh, uh, Charlottesville did what it did, but this really started it off. The Sons of Confederate Veterans, in response to calls remove the flag, the Confederate flag, which had been flying at the State House since 1962, first on the top of the Capitol building until 2000, and since then uh, on the Capitol grounds. They were demanding that it be removed. The Sons of Confederate Veterans, of course, came out and issued a statement. And you can imagine what they said, because many of these calls were coming from the black community. Their argument was, because black men fought as soldiers in the Confederate Army, this flag unites both races. <laughs> and the SCV continues to make that argument. Two Republicans uh, last year, about a year and a half ago, actually proposed in South Carolina to actually construct a monument to be placed on the State House grounds about or honoring the black Confederate soldier. So this narrative is still very much alive. It's alive because Americans still in 2019 still cannot reconcile themselves to the harsh reality of the Civil War era, the goals of the Confederacy specifically, which I outlined at the very beginning, and the true roles that African Americans played, both in the Confederacy to undermine it, and of course, for the, Confeder uh, for the United States to undermine it as well, serving as soldiers uh, in the Union Army. So I'm going to stop there. I didn't want to go on that long. I wanted to leave more time for questions, but we do have a few minutes if you have any questions. <laughs> Happy to entertain. Yeah. Go Actually, for it. Is this uh, myth of the black Confederates a lot like the myth that I also hear oftentimes about the Irish? Stars? Yeah, it's, uh, it is yeah. quite a lot. I mean, look, I think these narratives, uh, I think, serve the people who, who propagate them uh, for whatever reason that they need to reconcile themselves to the history. In the case of the black Confederate narrative, it's usually people who have an ancestral connection to the Civil War. They want to honor their white Confederate ancestor. And at a time when we are so much more focused on the war as a moment of emancipation, the service of African Americans in the United States Army, it makes their goal that much more difficult. Because they want to be able to do so without having to apologize. And they want to be able to do so, with, do so, with, do so excuse me, without being considered a racist. And the black Confederate narrative plays that role. And I suspect that's why it didn't emerge until the 1970s. Because up until then, white Southerners were pretty much in control of the overall narrative of the Civil War. They didn't really have to push back that much, if you think about it. Good question. Yeah, please. When we see the numbers in history books of uh, the Confederate forces, do those include camp slaves and things like that? No, this? usually the number you'll see are white soldiers. So in the case of Lee's army, um, when I say 75,000, you're talking about 75,000 roughly white men uh, present for service. Add on to that, of course, upwards of 10,000. Yeah. Please. Like Brian Stevenson said, the, um, the North won the war, but the South won the narrative. That's right. I, I think there's a certain truth to that. Um, you know, the other part of that narrative that I really didn't go into is this narrative of reunion that many white Northerners subscribe to by the beginning of the 20th century. And that narrative of reunion is that we are, at least in public, going to embrace our former enemies in the South for any number of reasons. The United States is becoming a world power on the world stage. Um, you know, how do we unify the country, put the pieces back together, put the family back together, and play our rightful, our, our rightful role on the world stage? And that narrative of reunion you know, plays out at, at veterans' reunions where the blue and the gray come back together. Think of Gettysburg in 1913 for the 50th anniversary. But there are many of these reunions. And I think between the lost cause and the reunion narrative, uh, 
uh, there's a certain truth to what you're saying. The, the sort of the story of, of African Americans as, as it's being taught today um, was in large part pushed aside, not entirely. The black community certainly continued you know, to celebrate its preferred memory and honor the men who fought in the United States Army. But African Americans don't have the same platform, political platform that whites do. They certainly don't have the money and resource to put up monuments in the post-war South like white Southerners do you know, in towns and cities across the South. I did have a question. Joe, please. What's the motive of, what's the motive of the Harvard professor? You know, I hesitated putting that in the description. I'm, <laughs> Who is he? Is he? <laughs> All right, I will tell you. I will, there are two, actually, and I'll tell you one. Uh, he has a popular PBS show uh, right now. It's James Henry Lewis Gates. And Gates has been pushing this narrative uh, since at least 2009. He first came across this narrative in North Carolina. He was filming a special for PBS called Looking for Lincoln. It's actually a wonderful documentary about Lincoln in, in American memory. And when he's in North Carolina in Raleigh, he comes across a ceremony sponsored by the Sons of Confederate Veterans to honor a former camp slave by the name of Weary Clyburn. And Clyburn was not a soldier. I have his records. Uh, he was clearly a slave, a camp slave. But the men, the individuals that Gates came into contact with at this ceremony were pretty clear that he should be honored as someone who served the Confederacy, if not as a soldier. There were some there who were, who were suggesting to Gates that he was a soldier. And I don't know what, what went on in his mind. Uh, the one historian that he talks to at Raleigh, he mentions uh, in a book that he published a few years later about Lincoln, uh, a man named Earl Imes, who is not really, he's never published anything in a reputable journal. He's, uh, he, he, he's a very confused man when it comes to this issue. He doesn't really understand some of the fundamental aspects about, uh, about this history. Uh, but over the years, Gates has accused um, American historians, people like Eric Foner. I watched one video where he accuses people like Foner of ignoring the service of black men in the Confederate Army because liberal historians don't want to acknowledge that African Americans were complex. It is just one of the most bizarre claims that I've ever heard. Um, he's made this point multiple times. The most recent time was when he interviewed Brian Gumbel on his show, Finding Your Roots. And he leaves Gumbel with the, with the belief that his, one of the, that his ancestor served as a Confederate soldier in the Louisiana Native Guard. Um, I probably shouldn't have said that because now I'm on, on video uh, saying it. But you know, it's in my book. I write about him for at least three pages. And, there's, and he's not the only one at Harvard. So you can imagine uh, the other one at Harvard um, published a piece about this in Root Magazine. You can look it up. Um, he believes that there were upwards of 6,000 black men who fought as soldiers in the Confederate Army. Never in this piece does he say how we arrive at this number. And of course, you might guess that when the SCV is looking for a justification for this, they're more than happy to go with a Harvard scholar. So I'm just throwing that out there. Yeah. I knew one of you would ask this. <laughs> I guess I wanted you to. <laughs> yeah, please, hey, Professor Big. Wonderful talk and important work that you're doing, but Thanks. I guess I sort of despair yeah. over all the mythology that's yeah. out there that, frankly, it is, you know, this is one symptom of the stuff that we see out on the internet with trolling and stuff. And I'm just, I, do you have any suggestions as to how we can possibly make it better? I mean, yeah. you know. Giving a talk today, it's, it's a great anecdote. We're hitting a small audience. Even it doesn't the do anything. That, it, yeah. there's no, there doesn't seem to be any way to get ahead of it. My book won't have any impact on this. I'm the first person to admit it. First thing to do is, of course, if you are an educator, you need to make part of your curriculum, a huge part of your curriculum, teaching your students how to properly assess, search and assess the internet. I don't care if it's about history. It can be about science, anything. Spend some time doing that. The larger point I want to make is, and I'll say it, I'll say it briefly, is that as pervasive as this narrative is, it never quite penetrated the most important places in our historical community. So it ends up briefly in a National Park Service exhibit. You have the book, of course, that I, I shared with you. But they're all temporary gains. In other words, my, the point I want to make, and if you go back to the 2011-2015 Civil War sesquicentennial celebrations that happened throughout the country, that was decidedly about emancipation, black Union soldiers, you would not have seen the black Confederate narrative. 
the point being, again, that this is still a powerful narrative. It confuses a lot of people. Uh, there's a way to combat it. But at least in terms of those institutions that we hope are doing the right thing, they know their history, it hasn't, it hasn't made a, a long-lasting appearance. So it's not much, admittedly. Do we have time for one more? Where are we past time? Well, I'll stick around, but thanks for, thanks for being here. Appreciate